Well, it's, it's that time of day and it's that time of week, so I'm grateful to all of you for, for being here. Um, I don't normally promise these kinds of things, but I think I can promise you a lively session, which could be called for, um, given the time of day and the time of week um, <laughs> that it is. Um, as Pierce said, I'm Eric McGilvery. I'm a professor in the political science department here. Um, I'm, I think, among other things, about things like democracy and inequality. Um, and so I'm very pleased to be moderating this session on e economic inequality and democracy, both sides of that um, term, economic inequality and democracy, as those of you who have been here have seen, have been brought up or discussed at length many times over the course of this conference. And so I hope this will give us a chance to sort of bring many of those themes together. I'm certainly not going to promise resolution. Um, but if we can shed further light on the issues that we've already been talking about, then I'll consider our job to have been, um, to have been done. Uh, the procedure we're going to follow here is that each of our presenters is going to speak for about 15 minutes, I think. Um, I'm going to spend about uh, you know, 20 minutes or so uh, moderating a discussion between them um, to sort of bring their ideas together, hopefully put them in conversation a little bit, and then we'll open the floor to questions from all of you and use the rest of our time for that. Um, purpose. And I'm going to introduce our speakers. You have basic information about them in your program, but I'll introduce them more fulsomely as they speak. So I'll start with our first speaker, uh, Jason Brennan. Uh, Jason Brennan is Robert J. and Elizabeth Flanagan Family Chair and Provost Distinguished Associate Professor of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. I don't know how you get through the day. Um, <laughs> He is the author or co-author of numerous books, um, including The Ethics of Voting, A Brief History of Liberty, Libertarianism, What Everyone Needs to Know, that was one book, um, <laughs> Why Not Capitalism, Compulsory Voting For and Against, Markets Without Limits, and most recently, Against Democracy, from which his talk today will be um, drawn. Um, so I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Jason. There are really like two big themes to all of my work. Um, theme number one is how can I stir up people and be contrarian? And theme number two is like, I think we put a lot of symbolic weight. When we think about policy, we tend to think of it in terms of symbolism. We treat politics as a poem. You know, as my, one of my friends, Robin Hans, likes to say, politics is not about policy. Politics is about signaling to one another. And I think of myself as waging a sort of philosophical war on symbolic politics, which is I think most, most other people tend to do. And these three books that I've written on voting, and I'll be talking about to some degree today, um, are all in a sense an assault on symbolic ways of thinking. What do I mean by that? So uh, the great economist, the Nobel laureate economist, Doug North said, the institutions are, institutions like private property or marriage or democracy, these are the rules of the game by which we structure our social lives. And we can ask, what kind of value, if any, do institutions have? So one way of thinking about the values, maybe institutions have value in the way that hammers have value, right? Hammers, no one cares about them for their own sake. They're a tool, they serve a purpose, and no one would insist on using a hammer when there's an even better hammer that's available, easily available, and no one insists on using a hammer when a wrench or a screwdriver is called for. But there are other ways we might value things. We might value things or institutions the way we value paintings. We think about the value of a painting, we care about whether it's sublime, what emotions it evokes, what it says about us when we look at it, um, and also who made it. Right? And finally, we can also think about pe uh, institutions the way we think about human beings. They can be useful, they can be sublime, and so on. They can be made by people, I guess. But the fundamental thing that's different about them is that they're ends in themselves as well. So what about our institutions, like the institution of private property, or the institution of democracy, or the institution of marriage? What kind of value, if any, do they have? My position, which I won't be able to prove to you in 15 minutes, but I will try to give a gesture towards, is that it really is just a hammer and nothing more. Which means if we can find a better institution, so that institutions were permitted to use them, though it's an open empirical question whether we can actually find any better institutions. So I often like to talk to and ask people, who do we blame for bad government and bad policy? And there's all sorts of people. I live in DC and I'm surrounded by the people with whom you want to blame. I have lobbyists for neighbors and bad bureaucrats for uh, you know, neighbors and all sorts of other people to blame. We should blame all of them, the rent-seeking lobbyists and you know, the corporations and the bad unions and et cetera, et cetera. But then after while we're blaming them, after we put, be finished with that, we should do one of these and point to ourselves. Because at the end of the day, democracy does kind of work. Democracy does have the potential and has a systematic tendency to, have, to reflect the policy preferences of voters, of the people who show up at the polls. Not just how much it, it does is up for debate, but it does do that. But what if the voters don't know very much? What if the median voter would fail Economics 101, or 
and a lot of questions they're being asked, like in this current election, have to do with economic thinking. What if they don't understand how government works? What if they don't understand history? What if they don't even know the general trends and the most obvious basic facts that are pertinent to the current election? Such as you may be voting on Brexit and you don't know like how much investment you get from the EU or how many immigrants you have, which it turns out the Brexit voters didn't know. They were way off by a large factor. <laughs> right? You're going to vote badly. What if you have a whole society, we're talking everything about incarceration, where you go around asking Americans, hey, what's happening with crime? And they're like, it's skyrocketing. It's like, no, it's been falling for 40 years. Like, for, you know, it's 20 years now. Like, you'll get problems. So there's a lot of inequality in how, in, when it comes to political knowledge. There's a great deal of political of inequality there. And there's a lot of variability in how people act as citizens, what they know, how they behave. They vary in how strongly they hold opinions. Some people have very fleeting opinions or no opinions at all. Other people, um, probably a lot of people in this room actually, for them, their political identity beliefs form part of their identity in the same way that a religious affiliation forms part of people's identity. And it's a very resilient identity. They're, they vary in how consistent their opinions are. Some people carefully check to come up with a synthesized, coherent ideology where all the opinions line up. And a lot of people have opinions that are contradictory, can't all be true at the same time. They vary how much information they have. Some people know a lot, some people know nothing, and some people are, know less than nothing. For them, ignorance would be a blessing because they make systematic mistakes about basic facts or about basic social science. They vary how they process information. Do they think about information rationally or do they kind of submit and indulge all of their worst biases? They vary in how they respond to those with whom they disagree. They might, some people, when they hear contrary points of view that are well argued, they go, that's pretty reasonable. And other people, no matter what, if you're on the other side, they regard you as stupid and evil just because you're on the other side. And they also vary in how much they participate. Some people vote often and early, and some people stay home. That said, we can kind of simplify it into two, three major sort of species of citizens. One is sort of an ideal type that doesn't really exist, and the other two are real types that are out there right now, and we're, everyone in this room is going to be one of those too. So if you've seen The Lord of the Rings, you know about hobbits. And hobbits don't really care much about the outside world. They just want to kind of still stay at home and chill out and eat their breakfast and their second breakfast and their levensies, and they don't really care what's going on. And the political equivalent of that would be somebody who doesn't really have strong opinions about politics, doesn't really find it interesting, doesn't really care, doesn't think much about it, and just wants to kind of live his or her life. And in the US, the typical non-voter would be a hobbit so described. They just don't really care much about politics, they don't participate much, and they don't really have strong or fixed opinions. If you've ever been to a uh, soccer game outside of the US where people actually care about soccer, you might have encountered soccer hooligans. So soccer hooligans care a lot about their sport and their team matters greatly to them. The fact that you are a fan of Manchester United really matters and you might hate members of other teams. So, I mean, I was in Brazil one time in Sao Paulo and I went to see a soccer game there and my concierge said, like, you can't wear any of these colors because you might get into fights. And I thought he was kidding, and then I drove up and saw that, no, actually, people are constantly fighting outside because of the two most rival teams playing each other. Soccer fans have high information. They know a lot. They're people that can recite everything that's ever happened in their sport going back 60 years, and they can do these calculations and all this. So they're high information people, but they're also extremely biased in how they process that information. So think about... Um, when Tom Brady is accused of deflating footballs, what does everyone in New England say? Guilty or not guilty? <laughs> not guilty. Which is the correct answer, of course. I'm from, from the greater Boston area, so that's of course the right answer. Um, and then the rest of the country, they say guilty, especially the right. damn Colts fans, right? Um, and, you know, or like if I could be looking at the same bit of information. I see a Red Sox player sliding into home plate, and the umpire calls him out, and I'm like, is, can he see? Like, obviously, that guy is safe. And then like my brother-in-law, who's a Yankees fan, will seize the same bit of information and says, well, obviously, he's out, right? So we're looking at the same bit of information, but we process it in very biased ways. So the political equivalent of that would be most politically active citizens. They have more information, they know more, they participate more, but they also participate in a highly biased way. They only look for information that confirms their pre-existing worldview. And for them, their political ideology forms part of their identity such that they tend to be antagonistic and avoid and try not to live near people that disagree with them, and they tend to befriend people who agree with them. Right? And that, unfortunately, is roughly the other half of Americans. Um, 
sometimes when democratic theorists are writing, they have in mind a group I call Vulcans, who are sort of ideally rational agents who don't have any loyalty to their beliefs, and they're like, when you show them they're wrong, they're like, oh, thank you for correcting my errors, now I'm not wrong anymore. <laughs> and oftentimes, like we read, especially deliberative democracy is done by philosophers, they have in mind how Vulcans would deliberate, and they're not talking about how actual human beings deliberate. All right, so what are voters like? More fine-grained. Well, we can summarize it like this. Voters are nice, but they tend to be ignorant and irrational. What I mean by nice is voters don't really vote their pocketbooks. Uh, Self-interest is a very weak predictor of voting behavior. Most of us tend to believe that, well, of course, my side, we vote for justice, and the other side, they're just voting their pocketbooks. You're pretty much right about yourself, and you're wrong about the other side. There's been a lot of studies of voter behavior attempting to see what the correlation is between self-interest sort of objectively defined and voter behavior, and there's a very weak co correlation, if anything, and it's dominated by other factors. So voters are kind of nice in that sense. They're what we call nationalist sociotropes. So they measure up that way, but they don't measure up in cognition because the levels of knowledge are extremely low, and also the way that they process information <coughs> is quite biased. What don't they know? Well, I could spend 20 hours talking about what they don't know, but pretty much it's like this. Think of something you might think is relevant to any election, and voters probably don't know that. Like voters basically know who the president is, and not much else. Most of them can't identify their congressperson off a list even right before the election. They don't really know what the trend lines are, like there's crime going up or down, is unemployment going up or down. Even if they can guess wh whether it's going up or down, they can't guess within five percentage points what the trend is. They don't know how much money is spent. Even when they ask them things like, hey, in 2000, this is a real statistic from the American National Election Studies, uh, voters, who is more conservative, George W. Bush or Gore? Most voters got that right. Like, just a slight minor majority of them got it right. Ask them follow-up questions. Okay, so you understand which one's more conservative. Uh, which one is more in favor of social spending? Which one's more in favor of abortion rights? Which one's more in favor of like, increasing education? Which one's more in favor of using social spending to improve the plight of blacks? And they get those wrong. So they know the word, but they don't seem to know what it means. Right? And that might have decided the election. I already mentioned Brexit, where people were just systematically misinformed about the basic facts. Why are voters like this? It's not that they're stupid, it's that they just don't care. It's an office space, that's what I mean. Like, it's not that they're stupid, it's that they just don't care. And it's not their fault that they don't care. It's built into the system. Because this phenomenon we call rational ignorance. The problem is that voters are aware that the likelihood of their vote making a difference is extremely small. There's some disagreement in political science about just how small it is. There's also a question of what voters think it is. But on most theories and most models, the chances of your vote being decisive are quite small. Now, most of you are Ohio voters, so congratulations. <laughs> your vote actually might matter in the presidential election. Um, I'm a Virginia, I live in Virginia, so my vote has like a, on one model has like a one in 20 million chance of being decisive. If you want to buy my vote after, I'll be happy to sell it to you. Um, just kidding. <laughs> uh, um, but on it, but your likelihood of being decisive for most people is quite small, and voters know that, and they act accordingly. So imagine I'm about to cross the street. I look both ways, not because I find traffic interesting, but because that information is pertinent to my life. And if I see a Mack truck barreling towards me, I wouldn't dare indulge the fantasy that it's not a regular Mack truck. That's actually Optimus Prime, my childhood hero from the Transformers, coming to whisk me away on an adventure. Let's go fight Megatron together. I wouldn't indulge that fantasy because if I'm wrong, I die, right? I would be punished by reality for being unaware of what's going on or for being indulging fantasies and, and false beliefs. And I was an insurance adjuster for a while, so I can tell you people aren't even perfect about but when it comes to politics, you can afford to be ignorant and you can afford to indulge beliefs right? because the chances of your vote making a difference are so small. A good way of putting that is if Donald Trump offers me $10 million, like he says, but I win, I'll pay you $10 million. I have a $10 million stake in him winning. It doesn't mean that I have a stake in voting for him in the same way that a winning lottery ticket is worth a lot, but an, indiv an individual unscratched lottery ticket is basically worthless. Or another way of putting it, um, suppose I have here War and peace. And in this, somewhere in the text of this book, I have hidden the instructions for where I've buried a million dollars on campus. Would you be willing to read War and Peace to find out the instructions? Probably, right? Now suppose it's not just War and Peace, it's rather somewhere in your five million tome library, I have hidden the instructions. Will you go to the library and read them all? No, there's a chance it'll pay off, but probably it won't. The expected utility is low. So Ignorance wouldn't matter if it didn't change your voting preferences, but it does. 
It's empirically, it's been confirmed over and over again, it actually has a big effect on our voting preferences. One way we know this is through something called the American National Election Studies, which have been conducted for over 65 years. They ask voters who they are, what policy preferences they have, and they give them a quiz of very basic political knowledge, like who's the president, what's the unemployment rate. And then when you get that set of information, you can then figure out how does information affect your policy preferences while controlling for demographic factors, like that you're white or upper middle class or educated or employed or male or that you live in the mid-Atlantic area. You can control for that and figure out how does information by itself affect preferences. A priori, it could go any way, it could diverge, it could have kind of random effects, but in fact, it turns out to have certain things. It turns out that uh, enlightened, the enlightened public tends to be more in favor of trade and more in favor of immigration than the actual public. They're in favor of more equality and more civil rights for gays. They're pro-choice. Even if they think that abortion is wrong, they think it should be legal. Um, they fa favor tax increases to offset the deficit. They're significantly less punitive on crime, um, which is germane to the things we were talking about earlier today. They're less hawkish on military policy, and they favor all sorts of forms of school reform. And interestingly, a number of, of people have used different data sets in the same kind of method and found the same kind of convergence. Now, what if you have simulate statistically what happens if Americans got all the questions wrong? They have actually the opposite preferences, which is a surprising result, too. It's not guaranteed by the method. And then you can ask, what about the actual median American voter? They're not like that. They're closer to what a simulated, perfectly ignorant voter would support. So when people ask, why is democracy good? My view is, it's just a hammer. And if we can find a better set of institutions, we should perhaps use them. So I'm not going to argue for it today. But in the book Against Democracy, I describe a hypothetical new type of system called epistocracy in which there's weighted voting of some kind. Right? Not everyone will get necessarily an equal vote. There's various ways of weighting according to knowledge. Now, a lot of people just strike them as inherently evil, and it's not clear whether it'll work. Maybe it won't. And I'm just trying to convince you, if it were to work better, it would be okay to use it. But most people think, no, you can't use it even if it would work better, because it's inherently unjust, and democracy is inherently just. They have hundreds and hundreds of arguments for that conclusion. In three minutes, I won't go through all of them, but I'll give you a few and say what I think is wrong with them. One of the claims that people make is that democracy is inherently just because it's important that you have a say, and that you consent, and that Empowered. But I think they're misunderstanding what democracy is about. Democracy is not about empowering individuals. Your individual vote makes very little difference. You don't have autonomous control over a democracy. I have autonomous control over my arm like with an experiment right now. Oh, hey, this is what I wanted. I'm going to now see if I have autonomous control over that cloud. Sink to the ground, cloud. It didn't. Unfortunately, voting is a little bit more like that than it is like that. Um, I don't consent to government. I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to test this out, but I have a. Uh, I, I know someone who was arrested over there for selling marijuana, and his life was ruined by it. And had he said to the cop, like, "Oh no, you don't understand. I don't consent to the marijuana laws," they would have not cared, right? <laughs> and it, it was much different from say when I buy a guitar. You know, if the dealer sends me a guitar and I say, "No, I don't want it," they don't send it to me. Nevertheless, people think, so that most kinds of arguments don't work, but there's another set of arguments that people find very persuasive. And that has to do with the idea that somehow democracy symbolizes the idea that we are all of equal value. And they're right about that, it does. But maybe that's just a contingent fact about how we think. So the Nazis used to wear, make Jews wear stars of David as a way of signaling in public that they are an inferior group. In effect, what we do with the I voted stickers and with the right to vote is we use that as a public method of recognition to say, we regard you as an equal member of our society. It's a little badge that we give you to say, you're one of us. But you can at least imagine people who think differently about the right to vote. Another quotation that I really like that goes along with this idea comes from the uh, political theorist slash politician Auburn Herbert. He says, the instinct of worship is still so strong upon us that having worn out our capacity for treating kings and such kind of person is sacred, we're ready to invest a majority of our own selves with the same kind of reverence. So he says, what happens in a democracy is that we level up rather than level down. We had a magical view of the king, we realized that was mistaken, but we still maintain the magical view of politics, and we just now give everybody the magic, and we use the right to vote as sort of a crown saying that you're magical. Imagine, hypothetically, a society in which, upon age 18, you receive a red scarf from the government. And the red scarf is a public marker that you are seen as a full and equal member of society. And then suppose the government says, you know what, we're not going to give the red scarves to gays. In that society, because the red scarf has all of this symbolic value, 
it would in a sense become really important that you get it, and if the government's not giving it to you, that would be like them giving you the finger. That would be like them oppressing you. But we recognize that it's just a contingent social artifact. It's just a contingent social construct that they've imbued the red scarf with all that meaning. It's not written to the fabric of the universe or the scarf itself that it has this meaning. It's just something they impute to it. What if we're just doing the same thing with the right to vote? What if the right to vote could just be nothing more than like a plumbing license? Like I'm not allowed to practice plumbing and I'm not humiliated and I don't feel like second class because of that. But it turns out in our society, failing to give people the right to vote is to give them the finger. Right? So one reason to think about this, if it is just a social construct that we think about the right to vote this way, then we might wonder if it's worth changing that social construct at some point. We wouldn't do it now, but maybe in a couple hundred years. So imagine we discovered the following. If I were to stick up my middle finger, what would that mean? <coughs> Disrespect, right? But suppose we discovered something about sticking up our middle finger. Suppose it turns out that when you stick up your middle finger, that this causes weird vibrations in the air. And when that air gets to you, it causes vibrations in your body and it cures cancer. <laughs> if somebody discovered that, we, that person would get the Nobel Prize in physics and in medicine, right? <laughs> and then what would we do as a society with that symbol? Yeah, we do it all the time. We could just change that right now. Like we could decide right now to make the middle finger a sign of respect. Like, anyone want to do that? <laughs> no? You're the first group that says no. I usually, have this, usually when I talk about this, it ends up with us all giving each other the finger and saying thank you. Right? So this is we could do that, and we might have reason to. What if it turned out the right to vote? We had reasons to change the way we think about it. All right, I'll end with one final point. One worry. I've been talking about a lot of things. I've gone through them quickly, and I'm happy to talk more about this in Q&A. But I mentioned that voters tend to be ignorant, and there's this big question about why democracy works as well as it does. And there's all sorts of mediating factors that immunize us to some degree from what voters want. So I mean, voters are basically like nationalist, socialist, mercantilists, and the actual policy we have isn't really that. So what's explaining that? It's a very interesting book by Martin Gillens called uh, Affluence and Influence, and he says that part of what's going on here is that um, po politicians have a strong tendency to side with higher income voters rather than lower income voters. And also, by the way, higher income voters tend to be high information voters, and low inf income voters tend to be low information voters. Gillens, when he wrote this book, one a part of him is like upset because he's like, I'm a de Democrat, small d Democrat, and I'm worried that it's like not a perfectly fair system. But at the same time, he also recognizes that high information, low information voters have systematically different preferences, and he himself tends to agree with the high information voters. So if we just did, if it were perfectly equal, we might have worse government. So one question you might ask is, does democracy work in part because it doesn't really fully work? So the bottom line, my view is that political equality probably does have significant instrumental value. Democracies right now are the best places to live and do a better job protecting civil rights and so on, though they have all sorts of flaws that we were talking about all day today. Um, they do a pre pretty decent job delivering just results as measured by just independent standards of justice. But perhaps there might be some political system that would do better, and I'd be open to switching to that if it did. <coughs> democracy is probably not an end in itself, and symbolic arguments for democracy, I think, are just not very persuasive. Um, we should regard democracy as a hammer, and if we ever find a better hammer, we should feel free to use it. So thanks. Our second speaker is Jeffrey Winters. Jeffrey Winters is professor of political science and founder and director of the Equality Development and Globalization Studies Program at Northwestern University, excuse me. He is the author of Power and Motion, Capital Mobility, and the Indonesian State, and of two books in Indonesian, whose titles I will not try to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> he is also the author, most recently, of Oligarchy, which won the American Political Science Association's Gregory and Lubert Award for Best Book in Comparative Politics in 2012, and his talk today will be based, as I understand, on that book. So I'll turn it over to Jeffrey. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for the invitation to be here. I appreciate it very much. Much. Um, I'm going to begin by uh, saying that, um, Jay, you're all worked up for a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. <laughs> um, U.S. democracy actually doesn't respond very much to the people you're most worried about. Um, they're essentially disenfranchised and their views actually are not much registered in the political system in any systematic or substantive way. U.S. democracy actually best serves affluent, educated, 
straight white males. Um, so, relax. Um, <laughs> not, much, not much to worry about. Um, my talk today uh, is going to be um, about a very different problem with democracy. Um, it's why democracy doesn't serve the many, um, and a little bit about who it does serve. So we start with a notion of the promise of democracy. Um, and the promise of democracy, whether we're analyzing it as specialists in political science, or whether we're just asking people um, in various societies around the world, what do you expect democracy to do for you? Um, when people get one person, one vote, um, when they get the right to speak, to participate, to assemble, to agitate, um, they expect that many of the pathologies, uh, many of the inequalities that exist in the societies out of which every democracy arises will be somehow addressed, not necessarily perfectly, but the various inequalities and stratifications um, ought to be um, tended to. And that democracy itself ought to have something to do with um, having that happen. Now, our expectation of non-democracies is fairly obvious. Um, we would expect them to be highly unequal. If almost all the power in society were concentrated in very few hands, we would expect that that power would be exercised for the purpose of taking most of the goodies that society has to offer into a few hands. Um, and we would expect that all the various societal pathologies of marginalization and domination and exclusion would either be maintained or maybe even grow worse. Um, as I said a moment ago, democracies arise from these systems of extreme domination and exclusion everywhere. But part of what democracy is, is a, at least a formal arrangement of power dispersion, plus increased freedom for participation, and so on. And the expectation of democracy um, is that it ought to produce more equality in various realms. It ought to address various social pathologies. That's, um, that's something that exists in the literatures on these things, but it also, you know, if you poll people, what do you think um, is one of the values? Why be in a democracy? Um, well, part of the hope is we can solve problems um, and that having more people engaged in that process increases the likelihood um, that the system will be more responsive to people. Um, well, does democracy uh, fulfill its promise? Um, and what happens if it doesn't? I want to point to two massive, I, I want to point to a massive contradictory trend, um, or two trends. First, democracy is definitely spreading and deepening around the world. This is a picture from around the early 1800s all the way up to very recently, and it's simply the number of democracies that exist on Earth. The trend is pretty obvious and fairly dramatic. If we just look at the last 50 years, this is a picture of the decline in the number of countries, according to Freedom House, that are not free. Um, again, from about 45% uh, down to about 25%. Uh, so, very, very, we're talking about roughly 200, 250 years of the urge to participate, the urge to be free, being expressed um, uh, around the world. Democracy has not only spread among countries around the world, but it has arguably improved within countries. That is, uh, if democracy is about 230 or so years old, um, with universal suffrage being about 100 years old, uh, within societies there has been improved inclusion by gender, race, ethnicity, region, religion, class, and so on. Uh, this is a quality of democracy measure. Um, not, by the way, on the output side, but on the input side. At least, who can be included in the process? That's one trend. The second trend 
is that over the exact same period of time, economic inequality has risen sharply even as democracy has spread. In fact, market democracies are among the most materially stratified societies in human history. And so the question arises, how could so much equality accompany so much inequality? It's actually quite puzzling. How can it be that political power shifts downward and wealth shifts upward? Political dispersion with wealth concentration. We are everywhere when we talk about democracies in the world today, we need to understand that we are talking about actually stratified democracies. That's what they really are. Democracy starts from stratification, especially material stratification. The astonishing thing is that it becomes more stratified over time. And so this raises the question, why doesn't democracy not necessarily produce full equality? That would be hoping too much. Why doesn't it, at a minimum, simply deconcentrate wealth as a democratic policy outcome? In other words, why doesn't freedom help? Here are some numbers to consider. This uh, is a Gini coefficient measure um, over the same period, around 1820 to around now. Um, that same uh, period when I was showing the spread in the number of countries around the world that are democracies. This is actually measuring individuals around the world. So it's not grouping, it's just taking the entire world population and saying, what has been the trend in terms of material inequality? Um, if we were to look at the same trend, but group it by countries, what we would find, so a moment ago by individuals, now grouping it by countries, we would see that if you took a Gini coefficient of countries and looking at 1820, we were looking at about a 0.16 Gini coefficient, which basically is saying that the wealth gap distributed across countries was relatively low. Um, but by 1950, that number had become 0.55. So in 1820, the richest country, Britain, was roughly five times the wealth of the average poor country. By the year 2000, the richest country, the United States, was 25 times the average poor. If we look at a comparison of the wealth pyramid, um, both for the globe as well as for the United States, um, first of all, um, what's interesting is that the United States, an advanced industrial service manufacturing economy, isn't that dramatically different from the wealth <coughs> distribution around the entire world. Um, in 2012, um, the top 1% of the population of the world counting all forms of wealth, had roughly 43%. Um, by 2016, the top 1% had actually crossed the 50% mark. When we look at the bottom numbers there, we can see that um, half of the US population has zero wealth. And by the way, where's the button here? Does it, uh, can't see that very well. But if you were to draw a line down at the bottom here, um, the bottom roughly 15 to 20 percent of the populations um, actually have negative wealth. What is negative wealth? Your total amount of debt is greater than your total assets. So we have a very skewed picture here. And it's accelerating. Um, now, these numbers I think are fairly familiar to people. Uh, the blue uh, is 62 people equal the total wealth of the entire bottom half of the world's population. 3.5 billion people, all their assets combined, are exceeded by just 62 people on the planet. And you may say, well, there's a lot of poor people in the world, you know, they live in villages, you know, that's a lot of numbers to accumulate, so. Um, but how about the United States? Well, the entire bottom half of the wealth of the bottom half of the population um, 
is equal to just 20 people in the United States. Now one of the fascinating questions when we look at this, two things, what direction of change are we heading in? Um, and just to show you how rapidly things are changing and how much wealth concentration is actually increasing today, in 2010, it took 388 billionaires to equal the bottom half of the population. So here we are just six years later and it's 62. But I would like, I like to ask audiences, at what point does the number, let's call it 62, 388, at what point do we assign the word obscene? Is it 40? Is it 10? Is it one? At which point does it become deeply problematic that politically, even under democracy, we're not able to do anything about this. Now I was just describing the concentration of wealth um, among all assets. I'm gonna switch now to describing only financial assets. And the reason it's important to switch to liquid financial assets is that when it comes to using wealth for the expression of power, because wealth is in every political system, autocratic or democratic, it is a power resource. But the f two things really matter when it comes to using wealth as a power resource. The first is, historically, the form that wealth takes. So say your wealth is in the form of land, cattle. Um, it's very hard to deploy land and cattle politically. Um, but if your wealth is in the form of fungible, liquid, financial assets, the ability to deploy in any political system, that power resource goes up dramatically. And so, not just wealth overall, but we should pay attention to liquid financial assets. And second, the second factor that matters for how easily or, or, or how impactful wealth is in a political system um, is how permeable the system is to the use of wealth. And those are policy decisions to it. You can never actually strip wealth of all of its power valence. But what you can do is change policies for how easy it is, think prior to and after Citizens United, how easy it is to simply use financial wealth to distort, influence, um, and control uh, political outcomes. And so now I turn to some numbers on uh, liquid financial assets, and uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff to look at here, but I'm going to direct you to just two things quickly. First, um, a moment ago I was mentioning to you that the top 1% globally owned roughly 50-51% of all wealth, but they control 985 of all financial wealth. And the bottom 99% of the population has 1.5% of all financial wealth. This is an extraordinary, mind-boggling level of concentration. Now, people have noticed, um, you cannot have not only inequality, but rising inequality on this scale. And by the way, the ripple effects of this are many. And there's been a lot of discussion of issues of race, gender, and so on. And there is no more racially and gender exclusive realm than the ultra wealthy. There are virtually no women there. And globally, they are overwhelmingly Caucasian, but there are racial differences within various societies around the world. And in every instance where race and exclusion by race is an issue, um, the patterns of racial exclusion are amplified on the wealth scale. Okay? So there are multiple ways in which this plays out. But one of the most important is that because concentrated wealth um, results in concentrated power, um, what it ends up doing is taking a system like one person, one vote and rendering it almost meaningless in terms of what people can actually do to control their society and control the agenda, which is why I was saying a moment ago, relax. The system, no matter how democratic, is actually not very responsive to the general population. Not only that, referenda aside, the general population doesn't get many at, uh, actual opportunities to substantively participate. 
except when they have to mobilize. And the big difference between wealth power and participation power is that if your wealth power is working for you in the United States via the wealth defense industry, your accountants, your lobbyists, your lawyers, your an army of people who are working on your behalf, you can actually golf. You don't need to be there. And there's no limit to the amount of your, the only limit to the amount of your power and the expression of that power is the amount of the wealth itself. Meanwhile, on the other side of the equation, people who are trying to affect change must be present. They must organize. They have to stop everything else they're doing. They can't work, they can't play, they can't attend to their families. They have to be present. And that in itself is a tremendous disparity of power. Well, there is um, increasingly we see uh, a, de a delegitimation actually of confidence in these representative institutions and with good reason. Um, and we see all kinds of expressions in our popular media of people's, you know, I'm not describing something that actually most people aren't aware of. Intuitively, they um, are aware of it. Uh, they may not know the numbers and the details uh, in the sense that I'm presenting them, but they generally know who's empowered and who's not. Um, I like this one, you know, oligarch, terrible word, we'll need a new one. Um, oligarch, by the way, is not a word that was much used. Um, a decade ago when I started teaching a class at Northwestern called Oligarchs and Elites, one of the students told me on the very first day, Russia has oligarchs, the United States has rich people. <laughs> very important difference. <laughs> and I had a very hard time 10 years ago convincing any Northwestern undergraduate in a seminar that oligarchy existed in a place like the United States. Interestingly, over the last three years, I can't convince any undergraduate that there is any democracy in the United States of any meaningful kind. Um, their view is pretty much anything that matters, uh, money is playing a dramatically important role in shaping. So we have, you know, all kinds of images coming out about how governments, in fact, are working for and presenting a feast to um, those who have the most resources and access to them, while the people aren't getting much. Um, I like this one. Um, no, Toto, I don't think we're in democracy anymore. Um, so. Let me just close uh, by uh, heading toward or offering um, possibly some answers. Why is it that democracy dysfunctions so much? Um, and why should elitists not worry so much about it? Um, and the reason is democracy actually, as we've designed it, only disperses some kinds of power in society and leaves all kinds of other power distributions intact. Power, I've been talking about the power of wealth, but there are other kinds of elite power access to education, access to information, being able to live in an environment of security, and so on and so on, having networks of access and expression. Um, and interestingly, having access simply to one person, one vote, and the liberal freedoms that go with it, um, don't really open up a floodgate of power opportunities to be able to change many of those distributions. They are <laughs> remarkably durable over the long trend of the history of human beings. That pyramid I showed you earlier of the distribution of wealth has been in place since wealth, since it became possible actually to concentrate wealth. It wasn't always possible. I won't go into the long anthropo anthropological story um, of, of when that became possible. But once the pyramid was put in place, all that really changed was not its contours, only who was in that top 1%. So one of the incredible innovations of overcoming royalty and the fixed position of one's life was not to change the pyramid, only to change the composition of who happened to be at the top. But there was always a top. That's what changed. And the fact that there was just a little bit of mobility made a dramatic change in the legitimacy of the system. And I'll give you an example of how you might think about it. If I told you that your chance of winning the Powerball was zero, not zero, how many of you would buy a ticket? The 
answer is not a single ticket. But if I tell you your chance is point zero and put 15 zeros in front of it and then a one, all of you will buy <laughs> lottery tickets, even though your chance is, in effect, zero, right? And that's what mobility and social mobility actually does to people psychologically and how it legitimizes um, the system. So I'm going to, uh, we, we were asked, can I, do I, three more minutes, may I? Okay, set a timer, three more minutes. Um, we were asked to specifically talk toward um, each other's um, material. So this part, you know, this is where my, you know, I say thank you and discussion. Um, and I'm gonna spend just a couple minutes um, directly addressing um, what Jason Brennan said. Um, because, <laughs> and let me put on my glasses to do this, sorry. So partly what was being presented, I would argue to you, was reasons to exclude people, justifications to exclude. Um, and part of this argument about people not being informed um, is, a, is about a question of saying basically, those who are at the bottom of stratified societies, um, we afford them too much voice and too much participation actually. So, People with already bleak life chances damage the rest of us, goes the argument. We, the innocent, privileged minorities, when we let them participate. So take away or reduce their political liberties or augment ours. Whether expressed viciously, politely, thoughtfully, or entertainingly, the message is the same. Let favored minorities run things. Protect us from the damage they can do. Putting us in charge will be better for them. I would argue that there is a single precondition for even entertaining such a proposal. And that is, only once we have achieved full equality of life chances and fairer and more equitable life outcomes. Only then may we give the best informed and most knowledgeable a weighted formal say in how to manage public affairs. But then, if my condition were met, you probably wouldn't need to reduce the role of the people that were being proposed to be removed from the process. And this, in turn, unmasks what lies beneath such a proposal. And that is poverty, domination, exclusion, marginalization, and a host of pathological stratifications are the actual problem. Diminishing the voice and the role of those most trampled upon is not a pathway to improving their condition. Although it may make the lives easier, for those living among the trampled. I actually side with John McCormick at the University of Chicago, who wrote a terrific book I'll recommend to you, Machiavellian Democracy. His argument is that the problem with democracy is that it is not representative enough. Our democracy, he argues, is something called an elective oligarchy. It presents itself as class anonymous, but it is in fact class specific in favor of the richer among us. His solution, going back to the example of Rome, a tribunate of the plebs. He argues for the creation, since democracy is already a class specific upward arrangement. By design, it is that, not by accident. He says we need a class-specific institution downward, a representative body exclusively populated by the non-wealthy. And they get their position in that institution not by voting, because the moment you introduce voting and campaigns, you introduce wealth power and the distortions that wealth power can, can uh, have in the process. He says do it by sortition. 
by lottery. Sample the poor and allow that institution to be class exclusive as a check on the stratified system that is American democracy. I'll stop there. I'm not sure what much to talk about. Uh, <laughs> but before we talk about anything, um, as a matter of fairness, I want to give Jason a chance to take a few minutes and respond if you'd like to uh, Jeffrey's remarks, and then we can move into discussion. Absolutely. So, you know, there's a lot of, like, you show things like, hey, the number of democracies has gone up, and the Gini coefficient has something something else. That's interesting, you know, but we all economists already know, like, there's this thing, phenomenon called the Great Divergence. It used to be everyone everywhere was poor, GDP per capita stayed stagnant for thousands and thousands of years, then roughly around 1800, it suddenly exploded where all the countries got, all countries got a little bit richer, and some countries got a lot richer. Just why this is so, the standard answer is because of institutions. Some countries had good institutions, some had worse institutions. If I wanted to know, is democracy having a negative effect on income? What I want to do is look at something like Gini coefficients uh, like correlated with democraticness. In fact, people do this all the time. You can go Google this as soon as you're done here and you'll find papers on it. So the, a lot of different groups have democracy indices that are cardinal rather than just ordinal. They're linear, there's degrees of, of dem democraticness. And in fact, democracies, the more democratic you are, the lower Gini coefficient you have. The less democratic you are, the higher Gini coefficient you have. And the cool thing about that is that's actually measuring wealth before income tax transfers, before welfare payments, which are also higher in democracy. So as a matter of fact, there does, is a positive, robust correlation between being democratic and being more economically egalitarian. There's a jumping back and forth between talking about wealth and talking about income, which is a common sort of trick that confuses people. But you know, we want to be clear what we're talking about. Think about wealth. You know who the poorest person in my four-person family is? Any guesses? I have two children, it's me, right? Now, I'm not poor, I have like a really nice guitar collection, I drive a BMW, I make like close to 300 grand a year. Like I do well, all right? But, but here's the problem. I have a $700,000 house, but I have a mortgage on that house, and though I have hundreds of thousands of dollars saved up, like in my retirement account already, and though I have a bunch of assets, I have a mortgage, and as a result, my wealth is overall slightly negative. I'm in that bottom group, but you wouldn't think that I, I'm one of the poor people, right? So mortgages and things, you have to take that into account. In fact, the richest person in my family is my eight-year-old son, because he has the most amount of cash, and he has no debt whatsoever. <laughs> um, so we want to look at that kind of thing. There's someone else today that I'm worried about. So global inequality is, in a sense, in, is an interesting. We want to look at inequality within the country. Now, he and I agree, in a sense, on one thing. Like, democracies are not perfectly egalitarian. The median voter theorem is not, strictly speaking, true. Now, uh, Page and Gillens, in a recent paper, argue that the effect of the median voter is basically zero, and it's only the high income, which are also high information voters. And there might be questions about the coding of that. Like, in their other papers, they were weaker on that claim. They didn't think it was that dramatic. And that's an interesting question. But does giving you more money really affect the outcomes? Does it actually help you? Um, the there's a very popular paper that you should read called Why Is There So Little Money in U.S. Politics? This is sort of the standard view among public choice economists. In fact, campaign finance doesn't really make much of a difference. Not very much is actually spent on campaign finance. The amount of money spent on campaign finance this year, and I'm sorry, all <coughs> campaigns this year, will be roughly equivalent to Nike's budget, even though uh, the, they're competing to control a four, almost $5 trillion budget, and Nike's competing to control a $100 billion market. So in fact, there's not a lot of money is being spent there. Where the money is getting spent that makes government responsive to some interests rather than others is through rent-seeking and lobbying, which is a post-electoral phenomenon. And that's not correlated in an interesting way with the amount of money there is like on campaign finance. It's not correlated with how democratic you are. It's correlated with other kinds of factors like the degree of regulation and so on. Um, so I'm, I guess I just don't think that you're, you're addressing the right issues. But if you really do think like, let's just give the power to all the people there's an assumption here that's worrisome. How many of you guys think it would be really like, what we should do is have everyone vote for Trump? Like we should have all the poor people vote for Trump. No, no one thinks that. All white people should vote for Trump. Like it would serve their interests if they vote for Trump. You probably think that, no, it actually matters. It's not enough to you to know that you're poor, or know that you're having problems. You need to know something about the social science. You need to know something about the facts and what's being prescribed and whether those policies are likely to help or hurt. And this is the problem. Voters are disincentivized from knowing much. They, they, 
because their votes don't count for very much, and they pick policies which they believe will help the country and themselves, but in fact aren't likely to help anybody. So I'll stop there. Well, this is the best kind of moderated discussion because I'm tearing up my script as I sit here listening to the various <laughs> things that are being said and thinking of all sorts of things I'd like to hear them talk about. I think I just heard Jason Brennan say something nice about democracy. Um, uh, and, and one of the questions I had here was that we've heard a lot of appeals to democracy as a kind of possible solution or, or way of thinking about solving various problems of inequality that exist. And you both seem to believe in different ways that democracy is either a failed or a flawed ideal in some fundamental kind of way. And so I wanted to ask, first of all, if that's a fair characterization, and second of all, um, if there's anything, maybe two cheers or one cheer you can give for democracy, or um, what kind of democracy, what aspects of democracy, what slice of democracy you would point to if you were going to say, yeah, here democracy can do something. But I'm stimulated partly because I think I heard Jay say something yeah. positive about democracy a second ago with regard to inequality. Yeah, so I'm, I'm seen as an anti-democratic person because I don't think democracy is magic. But um, I actually think democracy is the best system we've done so far. Maybe we can do something better. I have a paper out that shows that there's always robust correlations between things like, and they're causal, not just correlations, between things like how democratic you are and degrees of civil liberty, like defined independent of political liberty, how democratic you are, and Gini coefficient, how democratic you are, and respect for economic liberty and a bunch of other kinds of things we might care about. Income in democracy are positively correlated. The income of the bottom 10% of your society before pre-income tax payments are taken into account, and the degree to which you're democratic, there's a strong positive correlation there. So I think democracy, compared to all the other stuff we've done, is like really quite great overall. So it's just a question of like, well, can we do better? And that's, that's what's of interest to me. But you know, it's kind of like Master of Puppets is the best Metallica album, but I really hope the one that's coming out um, like two months from now turns out to be better than that. And I'm not saying that like, not this like is a lousy it. band. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess my, my position is that I see um, tremendous problems with the way uh, democracy works, um, but I would also point to the fact that um, it's not a dismal picture um, always. So if you look at just the 20th century of the United States, you see a very interesting story. If you go back to around the 1920s, 1930s, and you look at what was the um, you know, real living standard of the median household and how well were the really wealthy doing. And then you look over the course of the next several decades, one of the things you see is that between uh, the 1920s, 1930s and uh, the 1970s, the real living standard of the median household tripled. Meanwhile, for the wealthy, it actually remained flat or slightly declined. And then after 1970, actually it became flat for the median household and it took off in an incredible way for the wealthy. So the question is what was happening during this time? And the answer is it wasn't that some dramatic change had been made in one person, one vote, or, or that the United States political system was restructured. It turns out that within a free political system, it mattered how extensively the poor and the average people organized themselves for politics. So they had unions and they had other kinds of things which won policy outcomes for them. So I don't want to say that, that uh, democracy cannot be responsive in policy terms, uh, redistributive and so on. Um, it can. And in fact, I would even say something more dramatic than that. And this doesn't get put forward very often in uh, US civics classes, um, but if we go all the way back to the country's constitutional founding and the, and, the, uh, and the battle for independence, of course we had two constitutions. All right? We had one constitution we started out under, and the interesting question is why did everyone gather in 1787 for another constitution? Very simple question. I was never really taught this very well in civics class. Oh, there were problems with the Articles of Confederation. It wasn't working very well. Um, gripes about this, gripes about that. And then finally, they all came together in Philadelphia. Absolutely inaccurate story. The reason they gathered in 1787 was because democracy in the United States was hyper-performing. It was too responsive to the people. And it needed to be restructured so that the people 
could not use representative institutions in the way that they were. I'll tell the story briefly, give me two minutes, um, to completely reorient your view of US history. <laughs> After the war, when the last shots were fired in 1781, uh, the country lived for six years under the Articles of Confederation. It was a deep financial crisis after the war. There was an enormous amount of debt. It was a severe debt crisis. There were creditors in the United States and there were debtors. And the debt was falling on the average person, farmsteaders, homesteaders, and so on. And they couldn't pay their debts. They couldn't pay the war debts. And so there were debtors' prisons, something we don't have anymore. People were put in debtors' prisons if they couldn't pay. And their farm implements were taken, and their animals were taken, and their farms were taken by court decisions. Half of the 13 states decided to print money. Why? Because their legislatures were captured at the state level by the average person and they were responsive to the debtors instead of to the creditors. Some of you may remember Madison, you know, the wickedness of printed money, and we say, what, what in the world is the wickedness of printed money? Who could, who could possibly be upset about that, right? Why would that get written into the Federalist Papers? Because half the states were giving a haircut to the wealthy as a matter of policy, democratically arrived at. Rhode Island leading them, Carolinas involved, Pennsylvania and so on. The other half of the states were what were called hard currency states. Massachusetts being the leader among them. New York as well. And they were not captured by the poor and the average household. And they refused to let people pay their debts with depreciated paper money. And in those states, the people arose up and armed themselves. Shays Rebellion. But Shays' Rebellion was only one of hundreds of rebellions in Massachusetts alone. And suddenly, because of the dual panic over these two things happening, one, democracy was hyper-performing in half the states, and in the other half where the people were not getting relief, they took up arms. By the way, they weren't killing wealthy people. They didn't march on wealthy neighborhoods and burn their houses down. They marched on two institutions, the courthouse to stop the decisions against their fellow farmers, and the jails to release those who had been put in jail for debts. And everyone, several conventions had been called, and no one showed up during those first six years. We, we've got problems with trade, we've got problems with international stuff, states are doing policy. No one would show up. Suddenly, Washington himself was willing to come out of retirement and chair this convention, whose mandate from Congress was only to amend the Articles of Confederation. They scrapped it and rewrote it and designed an oligarchic structure which would block people from being able to use democracy against what they said was a, uh, uh, a minority. That minority was the wealthy. And so the experience of hyper-performing democracy led to a redesign so that democracy would be impaired in ways that made sure that the people could not deconcentrate wealth as a matter of democratic policy, if that's what they so wished to do. And so that's why the convention happened. And if you read, go read the notes of what they said inside that locked room. We have a problem of an excess of democracy in the country, the licentiousness of the people. That's what they said, and they locked the notes for 30 to 50 years so that no one could read them. So that, that, that's my assessment of the interplay between um, democracy and its potential and how it took more than 130 years for people to be able to once again or organize during the populist movement to put an income tax on the wealthy in 1894 which the Supreme Court, whose job those nine justices were tasked with to block when the people overstep their role, immediately struck down that income tax on the wealthy as being a communistic plot. And it took 18 years to pass an amendment to the Constitution so that we could have a federal income tax. 
and it exempted everybody but one half of 1% at the top. That's what the people did when they had an opportunity to actually use democracy for their own interests. They can't do that very well today. I've gone past the point of tearing up my strips and putting parts of the trash can at this point. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm just going to ask one more question, and then I will open it to the floor, because I'm sure people are eager to ask their questions. Um, and, and Jeff's remarks got me thinking about another thing that distinguishes the two papers, which is a different conception of the value of politics, or whether politics is, in fact, valuable. So and this is drawing partly on Jay's broader corpus, that um, there's a notion, as you can hear from, from, uh, from Jeffrey's work, that po political organization and sort of grassroots struggle is going to be the key, if there is a key, to, to solving these problems of oligarchy and wealth inequality and so on. And Jay's conception seems to be that, that there's a kind of, that politics is something that makes us worse, and that in fact, if we can take decisions out of the hands of political processes and put them in the hands of the competent or the well-informed or the... Or the um, Vulcans and um, technocrats. The, 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 right. right yeah. um, that that would be a better sort of outcome. So let, let me give Jay the floor first and see yeah. if that's a fair characterization of his view and if there's something about politics you'd like to speak in favor of as well. Yeah, I mean, when I say politics makes us worse, I didn't get into this here, but I just mean the tendency to participate in politics has a corrupting effect on most of us. It, it exacerbates our biases, it makes us angry, it makes us antagonistic towards one another. And so chapter three of the book um, reviews the empirical work on that and how, unfortunately, deliberation doesn't seem to deliver on its promises. Um, you know, it, it's, if someone talks about epistocracy, it's fun to sort of, one version of that would be like a totalitarian, technocratic system where you have a small band of people that like run the show and get to do whatever they want and like engage in massive amounts of social engineering. And that's obviously not the right kind of way to do it. But there's other kinds of systems that are not technocratic. Like I'm less technocratic than other people in this room in the sense that I don't actually want there to be lots of social engineering done by government. I don't think it's very good at that. But what I have in mind is something more like a system in which power is very widespread. It's not concentrated in the hands of the few. Like people say the, hand, the power of the many versus the power of the few. I'm talking about the power, giving power to everybody versus get, selecting in some way a subset of that many. Right? Including like there's a proposal by the uh, Mexican philosopher Claudio Lopez Guerra. He says, what if we have a system involving sortition? We randomly select 20,000 people and they and only they are allowed to vote right before the election. It's important that it has to be a big number because if you make it like a 200 people, they'll vote selfishly rather than altruistically. Um, and then, but before they're allowed to vote, they have to go through some sort of basic competence building exercise. Right? He thinks that would be a way that overcomes certain worries about the dispersion of wealth and so on. Um, so yeah, I'm, a, I'm in favor of the rule of the many, but not necessarily the rule of everybody. I think most people, I think a large percentage of people don't do us a favor when they vote. I think they do us a disfavor. And you would probably agree. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure people want to jump in, and so I'd, I'll just make one last uh, sort of intervention here, which is, um, uh, first of all, uh, I get horrified as much as anybody else when um, biases are expressed in democracy. In fact, one of the most awful things, I think, one of the biggest risks we have in democracies is precisely if they are majoritarian expressions of ugly biases. They exclude people who are not like them, um, they're willing to oppress people, and it appears legitimate because they've got a majority. So, I, I, And what we do is we build things into democracies like constitutional amendments and bills of rights that say there's certain things democracies can't do. So there are ways of addressing those things. I'm also um, not as dismissive of the knowledge and the competence of the average person. Now I'll start by giving um, maybe a silly example. Um, and the silly example is everybody's seen who wants to be a millionaire. Um, and there are two lifelines that you can go for um, if you're stumped. One is you can phone a friend, and that friend is supposed to be someone who you've selected because of their substantial knowledge. Um, and it turns out that phoning a friend um, gets the right answer 65% of the time. Or you can ask the audience, and the audience is right 91% of the time on who wants to be a millionaire. Now, there's some collective knowledge there um, that gets expressed. What, what I partly have a problem with is, again, I see Jay proposing all kinds of solutions to problems that I have trouble finding. 
Um, what we already have in representative United States is very, very low engagement by the very people that most worry Jay. They're already very minimally engaged. Meanwhile, the sheer number of experts of all kinds who weigh in on the policy process is massive. Tremendous amount of flow of information into the deliberations of committees and so on, and lobbyists and reports and everything else. So there's no shortage of, and, and the, the relative valence of that. You get to vote, but then the rest of government goes on. And it's all in those details. And that is a very, very highly informed set of people who are engaged in that process. If every day we were deciding by referendum, our every decision of government, I'd say, let me hear more about your ideas. Why don't um, we open it to the floor on, on that note? Yeah. There's a microphone floating around somewhere. There we go. Um, thank you both for sharing your very different critiques of democracy. It's a lot to process, and I'm sure I'll be thinking about it for a while after this. Um, so my question is basic, and if it's too personal, feel free not to answer it, but do either of you vote, and do you think that we should? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I vote. Um, not in everything. I don't vote in a lot of local elections, because right, I don't really know what the county controller does. I uh, should look that up, because I keep using that example. Um, <laughs> Is there an obligation to vote? Like, is one question, do you think you should vote? So my view is something like, if you are a well-informed voter and you're going to vote for the common good, then it's admirable for you to vote, though it's only one of many admirable things you could do. If you are a badly informed voter or you're gonna vote sort of in a malicious way, then you're being kind of a jerk and you should stay home instead. You owe it to me and the rest of us to stay home. And the reason for thinking that is something like this. If you come up with all the arguments people have for on behalf of an obligation to vote, they'll say things like, you should vote in order to exercise civic virtue, you should vote in order to avoid free riding on society, you should vote in order to um, pay your debt to society, whatever that is, you should vote in order to promote the common good or be beneficent. If you notice, all of those reasons are very general, and voting is just one of thousands of potential things that you could do to exercise civic virtue, to promote the common good. You could save the world, you could cure cancer, you could like be a good auto mechanic, you could, uh, like, you could engage in other kinds of political activities aside from voting. And so far, no one in the philosophical literature, despite lots of trying, has been able to come up with, this is why voting is especially the thing you must do compared to all these other alternative activities that seem just as likely to realize these generic reasons. So good voting is admirable, bad voting is, disad is not admirable, and abstaining is okay as long as you make up whatever general, generic obligations you have in one of myriad other ways. I vote um, consistently, um, and it's not because I think my vote is so meaningful, um, but I study places where you can't vote. Um, and it seems to me people struggle and die to get something that I might potentially just uh, discard and that seems, uh, that, that weighs on me. Um, but I also, I confront the same problem you do, which is when I walk into a voting booth, there's an incredible number of things and candidates. I, I do politics for a living, right? This is what I do, and I can't keep up. Um, but there are actually very easy ways of getting around this. Um, I walk in with a cheat sheet from an organization that I value, that I think does an excellent job of looking into the records of particular judges and what they've decided. Um, and so I walk in, and on the questions that I don't have my own uh, answer to, I rely on organizations and other specialists that I have investigated, um, and I find them to be um, a very good guide. Um, so I'm, I don't know if that makes me a hooligan. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you both, too, for very interesting talks. And my question is addressed to Professor Gunters. Um, you indicated that as societies be around the world become more democratic, they also become more highly unequal. And my question is, as societies become more democratic, do they also become more capitalistic? And if so, is equality possible or compatible with uh, capitalism? Um, I'm, since I give long answers, I'm gonna give a very short one, which is 
Um, when we think about oligarchy and democracy, we should not think of them as zero sum. Oligarchy, that is the expression of wealth power, does not increase because democracy decreases. It's not the absence of democracy that produces concentrated oligarchic power. Oligarchic power is the consequence of wealth stratification, first of all. Now, the question is, how do they coexist? How do you have a system which is organized so equally coexisting with an economic system that is good at doing two things, raising living standards and concentrating wealth? It does both of those things. Um, and the answer is that uh, the history of democracy shows that only impaired democracy can coexist with oligarchy, and that's exactly what we have. Okay, hi. Um, I have a question for Professor Brennan. So you were talking about giving some sort of test to the 20,000 voters or the sample to ensure they were able to vote. So who's making these tests, and how do you ensure that that process doesn't get polluted? I mean, deciding what kind of knowledge is more valuable than other types of knowledge when it comes to voting seems like there's plenty of room for sort of, I mean, elitism in a way, in a way of, a way of power, so. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think you're right about that. Uh, and actually, the competence exercise that he had, in, that uh, Lopez Guerra had in mind wasn't a test, it was actually having just the people deliberate together a little bit before voting, even that, just to give them something. Or giving them just very basic facts, like here's a cheat sheet, these are the people who are, here's the current party in power, here's how long they've been in power, here are a bunch of laws that have been passed, here's the unemployment rate, just stuff that's like unobjectionable. Because even that very basic information, they don't have, most people don't have that. And, it, and knowing it dramatically changes how they vote. But um, some versions of epistocracy do involve tests. Like I'm not necessarily saying those are the best one. The kind of system I actually prefer is what I call government by simulated oracle, where everyone votes, everyone takes a quiz of just that basic information. You just use what's in the American National Election Studies because we, all the political scientists use that, it's unobjectionable. And then you get their demographic information. And then what you do is statistically calculate, well, how would they have voted had they gotten a perfect score on that test? That's easy statistics. You can make the data public and anyone can anyone with like two semesters of statistics can verify it. So you can kind of make it public and get a lot of public checking on that. That's the one that I like the most because it's sort of wonky and I, I like weird things. <laughs> but um, in terms of tests, there's a lot of ways of doing this. One is you just use these very simple tests. One is you um, actually allow, I don't know if this counts as democracy or not, but you allow democracy to decide what's on the test. And then like that gets decided democratically. And then that in turn chooses who gets to vote on policy issues. And that might sound weird because like, well, if they're smart enough to pick what's on the test, why wouldn't they be smart enough to like pick the candidates? And I think the reason for that is something like this. If I ask my eight-year-old, like, what would make for a good president, like, what would make, if I ask my like, eight-year-old, like, what would make for a good spouse, he can give a really good account of that. If you ask me at age, like, 20, what would have made for a good significant other, I can tell you in the abstract what it takes to, like, meet those criteria, but I was terrible at actually selecting people that met them, <laughs> right? Um, if you ask the average person what counts as political competence, like, what would it take to be a good voter? It turns out they say pretty much the same thing I do. It's like, oh, you need to know something about the basic facts. You need to know a little bit about not just what, what those facts mean, like what the like the effects of policies are. You need to know who the candidates are, what they want to do, what they're able to do if they get power, and then like if they attempt to do what they want to do and impose certain policies, what would happen? I think that's in a sense an easy question that I think democracy is probably competent to answer. What I think democracies are sometimes quite bad at is picking people that meet that criteria. Like Trump voters, I'm, I'm gonna bash Trump right now, Trump voters mean well, and if I ask them what makes for a good president in the abstract, they're gonna say the same thing I do. The problem with them is how they apply it. They're not good at it. But um, uh, one thing, you talked about abuse, and it's really important, because I'm an instrumentalist about, about government. And so we often fall into this fallacy of thinking like, when we think about politics, what we do is we come up with an idealized version of the system that we want, and we compare that to a realistic version of the system we don't like. I call this the Jerry Cohen fallacy, because that's what he based his career on. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's an inside joke, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, so what you do is you imagine an ideal version of some sort of political or economic system, like we're running exactly the way you want, imagining everyone has like the right amount of virtue, and then how would that go? And you compare that to realistic systems, and they, the realistic system looks bad, and you're like, aha, it's unjust, we should do this instead. But really what you wanna know is, how would a realistic version of a system compare to a realistic version? Democracy is abused in a lot of the ways he said, and some of the ways I said. 
Like, democracy is abused, democracy is corrupt, epistocracy of any form will be abused and corrupt. And the real question is comparative. Like, which one warts and all, cuts and all, abuse and all, ends up functioning better than the other? That's all I care about. I just add that um, underlying your question, at least as I heard it, um, is partly th that different lived experiences in society make you differently able to pass whatever kind of test um, might be given. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're brighter or less bright. Um, you may be less informed, but being less informed is linked to where you live and how you live. Um, so how do we not have a test system favor those who already have positive life experiences to the detriment and the exclusion of those who don't? One example. Um, unintegrated schools, black kids do substantially worse on test scores. Integrate schools and the gap closes dramatically. It's just the different lived experience. When do we do the test exactly, before or after integration? Um, it would matter enormously for, for the outcome. And, and one other thing about the difference between specialists or those who are more informed, more competent, Generally, we're persuaded by ideas like that, but let me give you one quick example from the state of Alabama. In the state of Alabama, juries, and I don't know how supportive you are of juries, um, but juries are randomly selected. The first thing I would get rid of is the ability of lawyers to intervene in the composition of juries. Simply a lottery and leave them there. And don't cherry pick the racial composition and the gender composition because now the specialists in our society are shifting things in a particular direction where sortition would just give us a representative sample of our community, a jury of our peers. In Alabama, briefly. We have a lot of questions in oh. the queue, so I want to really encourage you to. Very, very briefly. 10 seconds or something. 10 seconds. Juries decide both to convict and the penalty. But judges can overrule the jury on penalties. In, since 1982 till now, a quarter of all the decisions by juries on, on penalty between life and death were reversed by judges. A disproportionate number of those reversed, changed, overridden uh, decisions where the judge said death and the jury said life imprisonment, they were wrongful convictions. And, okay, well, wait, 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 one last point. One, <laughs> All right, I'll stop. I'll stop. Let the people speak, man. <laughs> well, well, no, but, but, but the, the speculation. No, 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 we're no, doing no, no. so well. The, the speculation on why, the speculation on why is that a jury that might be willing to convict has a lived experience very different from the judge of the fallacies of the system when it comes to actually killing someone. And they were more reticent to kill than they were to convict than a judge who's much more confident in how the system gets it right. There we go. Sorry, so, stop. Go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, this, this question starts out for Jay, but I, I think uh, might have more uh, general um, applicability to the panel. So, um, Jay, you, 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 in an important part of your argument, you cite a very strong theoretical reason why people don't inform themselves um, and or participate, which is it's rational ignorance and rational non-participation. Um, do you have any empirical evidence for that? The reason I ask is I can see and have myself done some, some evidence to suggest it's exactly the opposite. So for example, if, you know, if it's probability of winning, then you know, national elections should have the lowest participation rate and local elections the highest. That's exactly reverse of that. If it's education to understand that it's in your rational self-interest interest to abstain, um, then more educated people should be less likely to vote. Um, that reverses. There's, I, I could, I won't go on, um, but there are a lot of reasons to think, um, in addition to simply asking people why they don't vote or why they don't um, inform themselves, that don't go with rational self-interest and in fact tend to track whether they think they're going to be listened to, whether, whether in fact they're part of the oligarchic power structure. Um, and, and all of the, the characteristics associated with that are the people who are more informed and more likely to participate. If so, that seems to mean that epistocracy, the potential for epistocracy is internally related to the, the form of government and that precisely to the extent that things were more democratic in Jeff's sense, 
democracy would work better on your terms. Yeah, so for what it's in a sense, I don't have to hang my hat on the rational ignorance or rational irrationality story. I find that explanation for why people are like that convincing, but there are people that think, no, people just happen to be ignorant, they just happen to be irrational. And, um, but I guess why I find the story persuasive is it's just the case that democracy, you, you don't get punished for your behavior. So it's rational in that sense, like misbehavior. Um, I look around my hometown, I see that there's poverty. Trump will solve the problem. I do not get punished for deciding as such, though we might get punished if we all decide as such. That's just a very weak kind of claim about just what's the feedback mechanism. Um, so I guess I agree with Rob and Hanson. I think for most people, politics is not about policy. Politics is about forming a tribe and like having another group that you're antagonistic towards. It's a way of sort of expressing your values to others and to form coalitions with people in that you can, so you can have like cooperative ventures. And I think, I think politics writ large is simply um, an expression of our intergroup bias. And I think you can see that by the way people behave with regard to politics, such as, I mean, the main, the main thing that predicts whether people participate in politics, like the biggest predictor, and also it's the biggest predictor if they're knowledgeable, is just do they find it intrinsically interesting? Is it fun? So it's like political nerds who think like they like the drama of it. And that goes along with the fact that they vote in national elections more than they vote in local elections, even though the probability being decisive is much lower in national elections than it is in local elections, though it's not very high there either. Um, they spend a lot of time thinking about national elections and not about the small stuff. They, uh, um, if you ask most political participants, you survey, Diana, Diana Mutz, who's a political scientist at um, Penn, whose work I really admire, did this work where she went around asking people, like, hey, you're a Democrat, why would anyone be a Republican? And if you answer, because they're stupid and evil, you probably participate a lot. And if you answer, <laughs> like that predicts that you participate and that you give money and you vote often and early. Um, if you answer, well, you know, some Republicans are reasonable and they explain their views in a way that a Republican would find acceptable, that predicts you don't participate. Um, and also like the clustering of views that you see. So there's this weird phenomenon when it comes to political behavior. So suppose I have a person here and I tell you about this person. Um, she is pro-choice. What's her stance on gun control? What is it? Pro. She wants, she's like not really in favor of gun control. She's pro-choice, so she's pro-gun control. I have another person here. Um, she thinks that greenhouse gases aren't really that big of a problem. Uh, what's her stance on Black Lives Matter? Yeah. That's weird. Why are these beliefs clustered together? I mean, if you said like, well, the Democrats are clustered together because they, the, the, um, they all happen to be true. That, that's one thing, but then why are the Republicans <laughs> clustered the exact opposite way on all these different things? It's because it's what's going on is we are consuming fun, by, we are consuming fun team antagonism. It's like the Yankees Red Sox rivalry is fun. I know because I'm a Red Sox fan. It's fun, but harmless. More fun now than it used to be. <laughs> yeah, more fun now. And actually, like the you know like the E number for the Yankees is one, so they might like if they're playing tonight. Like they're going to be out like tonight. It's good. Today's a good day, and the Red Sox are going to win the full season. It's fun. The problem is we do the same thing in politics, and it's fun for us as individuals, but collectively the result is we get somewhat worse government than we otherwise might get. So that's what I think is going on. I think that's why they participate more in national elections than local elections, um, because of the romance of politics. Um, so my question is for Professor Winters. Um, so we've heard your critique of democracy used and abused by oligarchs, but what do you think the solution is? Is there a solution? Um, is it one vote for everyone, 100% of people vote? Is it no lobbies? Like, what do you think the solution is? Oh, wow. Um, so the, the presentation we had earlier where um, someone said, <laughs> You know, we're very good at raising problems, but we don't do a very good job of producing solutions. Um, I didn't come here prepared to talk about <laughs> solutions, because um, I was told I had 20 minutes. Um, so um, let me just say, I'll, I'll do it really simply, simply. First, the simple things we can do. We can decide in terms of policy how easily or how difficult it is to use wealth power in our political system. We can change that. We've had periods when it's been harder. We're in an era where it's incredibly easy. So I would say I support policies that diminish the expression of 
um, wealth power. I would also say um, we have to do something about the way we look at the globalization regime so that I'm not, I'm not going to say that as jobs are lost and as, and as middle class declines in the United States that it, it's bad that jobs have actually moved. Industrial manufacturing jobs have moved to China. China's living standards have gone up and that's incredibly important. However, in that uh, transaction, and they're connected to each other, it went from being a place where there were freedoms to a place where there are not freedoms. No freedoms to organize for workers in China. And so I think it's important if you want to raise up the standards, we're in a globalized world in, in a way in which we're connected to each other very intimately in ways that are new historically, and we cannot pursue democracy and empowerment here if it is not a part of what we do internationally as well. So I would say it's harder now. It was hard enough to organize and to strengthen people from below inside a single country. The challenge is to have a global perspective on that because you will not be able to do it simply within the United States. That's just not the way the world is organized today. I should mention that our, our conference this time has been focused largely on domestic inequality and our intention is in the spring conference, Compass Conference, which you all attend, I hope, um, to focus exactly on global issues to do with inequality and global factors affecting inequality. So please return next semester for that conversation. <laughs>